Hello everyone, Blackfoot Ferret here. I've completed my second floor reading of the new FNAF novel The Silver Eyes, and I have a lot to share with you today. First, the book is amazing. It obviously was handcrafted over ten months and features a beautiful character-driven narrative involving several kids, many adults, a few lovingly dangerous robots, and more than one villain. If the movie is anything like this novel, we're all in for a real treat. Which is why this video is not about that story. If you'd like a sample of the novel, check out Rosbowski's reading or pick up the digital, physical, and hopefully soon audio version of The Silver Eyes from Kindle or whatever it might be by now. This video is about all the game-relevant bits of lore that are hidden throughout the novel. What can The Silver Eyes and its parallel world tell us about the hidden story of the games? and what specifically does this novel confirm or disprove on my own FNAF series, The Final Theory? The book is definitely in another world. The timeline has changed, with the main five children being abducted over several months in 1985. The story begins ten years later when Charlie, the daughter of the inventor of the animatronics, returns to the town she fled after her friend Michael became the fifth child to vanish at Freddy's, to attend a memorial in his honor. All the kids have distinct appearances, and none of them appear in the FNAF minigames. The story is told both in real time and in Charlie's flashbacks and occasional nightmares to come with each new discovery she and her friends make. The restaurant, which which, of course, they visit repeatedly, is heavily modeled after FNAF 1. Foxy resides in Pirate's Cove. Freddy, Bonnie, and Chica are on the stage, and Golden Freddy goes wherever he wants. There's an office, a bathroom, a closet, and a kitchen, and doors that stop animatronics and psychos with varying degrees of success. That being said, traces of FNAF 2 can be found in the carousel and side party rooms, even though there's no sign of the toy animatronics. The arcade from FNAF 3 takes a lot of damage, and we know the origin story of two characters from the third game by the end of the book. There may even be shades of FNAF 4 locked away in the old house of Charlie's father. The novel creates another world adjacent to the FNAF game world, or the new set of mysteries of its own. However, in the process of telling its story, Silver Eyes reveals major details about the background of the FNAF games themselves, details that cross dimensions that are relevant to both worlds, essential clues for any theorists trying to solve the story. So now that my foreshadowing is done, it's time for the public service announcement. From here on out, this video will contain massive spoilers. No. MASSIVE SPOILERS! Again, MASSIVE SPOILERS! So if you haven't read the book or listened to it, please go and do that before I ruin these discoveries for you. Huge things happen in this book, and it's best to discover them yourself. Then, when you're done, we can come back here and finish our chat. Now, for those continuing on, put batteries in your flashlight and put on your Freddy head, because we're going for a dangerous wild ride. Item 1. The Purple Guy is the FNAF 1 Night Watchman. After finding Freddy strangely intact and breaking into it a few times, Charlie and her friends find the Night Guard waiting for them. Rather than arresting them, he accepts their invitation to join them in exploring Freddy's. This man is described as immediately off-putting, tall and slightly too thin for his uniform, which bagged at the shoulders and waist, as if he used to be larger in better health. Later, sneaking around Freddy's, he moved fast, scuttling almost sideways and darting his eyes back over his hunched shoulders. So our Night Watchman basically looks like this. Then, our friend the Purple Guy has a life change changing epiphany. When introducing himself to the kids, he looks down in surprise at his own name tag, pointing to it, and realizing, my name tag says Dave, so Dave must be my name! Okay, so... Dave quickly proves that he's more than just a security guard. Earlier, the kids discovered two hidden mini-control rooms, each the size of a refrigerator laying on its side, which each controlled half of the lights and animatronics at Freddy's, allowing a two-man team to program and maneuver the robots completely out of view of the main office. The kids have little luck using the unmarked controls, but Dave instantly and fluently activates them to make the robots dance, clearly having used them before. Item 2. The Purple Guy is the Murderer and Wore the Yellow Bonnie Suit once in Freddy's, Dave sets up a distraction, then slips away to the main office to retrieve and put on the yellow spring bonnie suit, then grabs one of the kids in the confusion. Jason witnesses the grab and swears the bonnie did the kidnapping, although regular bonnie is still on stage. It's quickly revealed in flashbacks and further attacks that Dave has done this many times before. Item 3. All the children were killed in springlock suits. Charlie's flashbacks reveal Fredbear's family diner, the establishment with the two yellow spring animatronics, which alternated between fluid human motions or jerky robotic movements, depending if a human was in them or if they were set to animatronic mode. Charlie's dad demonstrates the dangers of spring locks and why you should never play with them. Back at Freddy's, Dave traps his abducted kid into one of the first characters Henry, Charlie's father, ever made, a crude suit we don't recognize but is clearly a spring lock suit, which threatens to go off and crush the kid with every slight motion. This is a spring suit, the yellow spruits were spring suits, and it quickly becomes clear that that Freddy, Bonnie, Chica, and Foxy were all spring suits as well. Item 4. Spring lock failures are a chain reaction. Any small movement can set off a spring lock, especially the jarring impact of another one firing nearby. So spring lock failures are like dominoes or firecrackers. They quickly spread throughout the suit like wildfire, releasing the animatronic parts and fully impaling anyone inside. These chain reactions are demonstrated twice in the book, once attempting to free the kid, and again at the climax of the book, where we get to see, firsthand, the process by which a human in a spring suit becomes a possessed animatronic. Item 5. Spring suit 
suits act as power armor. Why would anyone voluntarily wear these walking death traps? We see many people injured by snapping spring locks during the book, and Dave has a massive symmetrical scar collection that shows just how much damage spring locks can do to the human body even when you use them properly. Yet both Dave and Charlie's father Henry, the inventor of the suits, wore spring suits for years as the Yellow Bear and Rabbit team at Fredbear's Family Diner, and later again at Freddy's itself. And our good friend Dave is happy to show the kids, and a poor policeman who came by, just how easily even an emaciated man can overpower people and toss them around like toys when you're wearing a spring suit. The animatronics can toss arcade machines across the room, as can any human armed with such a suit. Item 6, but that isn't the true purpose of the spring suits. We're clearly missing something. If strength was the goal, an inventor as brilliant as Henry could just as easily have made a powered exoskeleton without any spring locks or impaling risk. But Dave feels an almost religious attachment to his yellow bunny suit, seeming deflated and empty whenever without it, and gaining a strange wild vitality whenever in it, as if part of himself had been restored. Later, when captured, Dave refuses to even talk to Charlie and company until they place the yellow bonnie helmet on him. Then he adopts an entirely different voice and personality, his human eyes turn glassy, as if the suit is talking instead of him, not Dave, claims that the robots will kill all the kids, but not him because I am one of them. We see these glassy eyes on another character, as John shares a memory about the day Michael was abducted. First, the animatronics went crazy on the stage, then a bear who was not Freddy walked up to the table, while a human technician walked up to the stage, much in the same way the animatronics freak out at the set of Dave when Charlie and friends visit. The bear had dead yet functional human eyes, and was the only one not watching the kiosk and stage. Then the bear, who John remembers later was yellow, and Michael both vanished. Henry and Dave are found together in multiple memories and pictures throughout the novel, with Henry always wearing the yellow spring Fredbear suit, and Dave wearing the yellow spring Bonnie suit. Whenever they wear the suits, they mentally change gears into their personas as Fredbear and Springtrap. Take Bruce Wayne, for example. Bruce Wayne is the costume, the careless playboy facade he shows the world. It's only when evil strikes that he puts on the cool winged mammal costume to avenge the innocent that he dons his true fursona, that of Batman! Yes, dear viewers, Batman is a furry. He can stop calling us lame. So the possibility of being impaled by the spring suits is clearly a design choice from the beginning. Many rows of spare costume heads on the wall and strange robot toys Henry made for Charlie at the old house have a strange self-awareness about them. And by the end of the novel, we learn from an impeccable source that the souls of the dead children are indeed residing within the animatronics. Item 7. Golden Freddy is a ghost, a good guy, and child number 5. Freddy, Bonnie, Chica, and Foxy have a major disadvantage. Whenever they shut down, it seems to reset their short-term memory, making it hard for them to tell between friend or foe. Fortunately for them, they have someone they can turn to for answers who doesn't forget. Because Golden Freddy isn't an animatronic anymore. He's a ghost. The first paranormal sign at Freddy's is when the children's drawings begin to change, and tell the story of a kid being kidnapped by Bonnie, or wanting to leave the restaurant which comes too late. Then Golden Freddy appears to the kid trapped in the old Springlock suit, calming them down, then revealing the horrible secret of exactly how animatronics are made. Charlie and the kid both see Golden Freddy at the same time, and she recognizes the suit as the very same one her father used to wear at Fredbear's family diner, except this one appears empty, slumped in the corner, with two pinpricks of light for eyes, and then vanishes without a trace. Then, at a truly terrible moment in the story, Golden Freddy appears out of thin air, a golden bear suit standing upright with nothing to support it inside, and reveals his greatest secret, that he is Michael, their friend, and the last of the five children abducted during the months of disappearances at Freddy's. The kids move to hug him, but a distraction occurs, and when they turn back, the suit is slumped again without any sound or visible movement, and the next time they look back, it's completely gone, without a trace, like it was never actually there to begin with. Like all the Phantom animatronics from the games, Golden Freddy resembles the suit he was stuffed into before being disassembled or purged from his robot. Michael was abducted by Fredbear and Purple Guy, and was then stuffed into Henry's own Spring Fredbear suit. Item 8. Henry, Charlie's father, is the pink guy. There are two explicit references to Henry, the book's equivalent to the phone guy in the games, as being pink. First, Charlie had a play cabinet in Henry's old office, which was a salmon color that Charlie had always insisted was pink. The second is in Chapter 8, when Henry and John find the picture of Father in the yellow Freddy Fazbear costume. The head was tucked under his arm, staring sightlessly into the camera, like Golden Freddy. But Charlie's father was smiling, his face pink and sweaty, as if he had been in the costume for a long time. Beside him was a yellow bonnie and from the photo, a human is clearly in the Spring Bonnie suit. We learn the true name of Dave the Purple Guy, William Afton. Henry and William were the joint owners of Fredbear's Family Diner and Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. With Henry being the artist and genius behind the animatronics, and William being the businessman who made it work out financially. The two men have been working together for years at both restaurants, in spite of all the murders, and in spite of Mr. William Dave Afton donning the Spring Bonnie suit and abducting Sammy, Henry's son, Charlie's twin brother, from Fedbear's family diner, never to be seen again. 
Dave, in his Springtrap persona, explains that he helped Henry create. Yes, Dave was the principal murderer, but he did it for a reason. He helped Henry create animatronics. Henry seems to be a much more sympathetic character than his sociopathic counterpart phone guy from the games. He clearly loves his children, and his wife, and Charlie's early memories of Fredbear's are happy ones. And yet, there are many references throughout the book about how Henry was always preoccupied by something, thinking about his robotic creations constantly even when doing mundane things. John shocks Charlie with the disturbing news that many people in town thought Henry might have been responsible for the murders, and as the book progresses, she finds this idea harder and harder to dismiss. And love might have a different meaning to a mad scientist than it would to ordinary people. When interrogated, Dave, as Springtrap, says, I helped him create. And then, we both wanted to love. Your father loved, and now I have loved. A mad scientist might consider giving someone immortality as a soul residing inside a robot to be a gift, even if the subject might disagree. And like our friend Bruce Wayne, there's no guarantee that a person's public self and their secret inner persona will both be good or even resemble each other at all. Soon after moving to the new house after Fredbear's family diner closed, Charlie's mother disappeared. Charlie cannot remember her ever saying goodbye, and assumes she left because the mutual pain was just too unbearable. Charlie lived along with Father for some time, watching him build robots, including all of the main animatronics. The memory was mostly positive, except for one thing. One of the robots, an endoskeleton with blazing silver eyes, would always sit in the corner of the workshop, twitching like it was in pain. Later, returning to Freddy's, Charlie discovers the silver eyed endoskeleton again, inside Foxy, Henry, and Phone Guy's favorite animatronic. In the FNAF games, Phone Guy is stuffed into the Spring Fredbear suit by the kids during the FNAF One Night Four phone call event. In the Silver Eyes, Henry commits suicide by stuffing himself into an endoskeleton that Charlie has never seen before. There is no costume on the skeleton, showing its complexity similar to a living thing with its bloodless circulation of wiring. But if you wore the same suit in death that he did in life, we know who this endoskeleton belongs to. Fredbear. Henry and William Afton were friends and partners in crime. They were the pink guy and the purple guy. They were Fredbear and Springtrap. They were the Color Brothers. The mad scientist team was searching to put a human soul into a robot. By the end of the book, both Fredbear and Springtrap are in functioning in animatronic form. Charlie returns to the old house after 10 years being away and living with her Aunt Jen, only to discover that some of Father's tools look well maintained and used. And there's a strange deep furrow in the gravel outside that goes all the way to the dirt, which suggests someone, or something heavy, has used the tools and been to the house relatively recently. And then there are questions about Charlie herself. Why does she have strange lapses in memory? She seems to have unusual physical attributes, like pronounced strength, clammy skin, and an unusually high tolerance for pain. She can bleed, but has a great aversion to hospitals, something her Aunt Jan seemed to instill in her, and insists on using simple drugstore first aid supplies even when taking a Wolverine-style super combo hit. Why does Charlie have three strange closets, the smallest of which contains an animatronic doll that used to look exactly like she did at an earlier age? Why is the big girl closet, which used to be sealed, now open and empty? Perhaps, after losing one child, father took extra precautions to make sure he didn't lose another. Or, perhaps, her brother wasn't actually lost, and has been around in a different form all this time. The Silver Eyes has its own set of mysteries separate from the games, and there are many directions speculation could take. I certainly hope there's another book. However, one thing is very clear. Henry, Charlie's father, is the paint guy. The mad scientist who created the animatronics, the book equivalent of the phone guy from the FNAF games. He is Scott Cawthon's own character of the novel, and the single most important character in all of FNAF's epic story. Trying to explain FNAF without the paint guy is like explaining Masters of the Universe without Skeletor, or Transformers without Megatron. It just doesn't make any sense. So, to recap, here's what we learned from the Silver Eyes. There are two villains, who both wore and were stuffed into the two golden suits. Golden Freddy is child number five, who was stuffed into the Spring Fredbear suit, then removed from it. Freddy Fazbear's Pizza is a foot for a mad scientist, who's harvesting children and security guards as test subjects, learning how to put a human soul into a robot. The FNAF One Night Guard is the purple guy. In the novel, his name is William Dave Afton. In the game, his name is Mike Schmidt. In a nutshell, The Silver Eyes completely confirms that my second video in the Final Theory series, The Color Brothers, was the real answer to FNAF 3. Scott said that someone in the community had discovered the answer to FNAF 3, and I was that person. I thought I was onto something when Scott unexpectedly released FNAF 4 the day after I sent him an email link to the Color Brothers. He had a whole countdown series of teaser images planned, but suddenly scrapped them all and released the whole game two weeks early, causing great inconvenience and confusion to Markiplier and other prominent YouTubers that were at a convention. You can only do something like that for a very good reason, and someone putting the answer to FNAF on YouTube certainly qualifies. 
Thank you for the awesome games and the novel, Scott. If the movie is anything like the book, it's going to be amazing. I'm sorry if I gave you a bit of a scare earlier on, but if the last five months are any indication, you had absolutely nothing to worry about. So, it's a new year. Where do I go from here? I still have to finish Jeremy's Last Sight, the final video of the final theory. What I believe to be the solution to FNAF 4 and the story of Shadow Bonnie, Golden Freddy's friend and nemesis, revealed at last. And in spite of everything that's happened, I'm still going to use the revised November 11th version of the script. I've been conflicted about this video for a long time now and found making headway impossible. But now I have a clearer sense of purpose, and will finish the video like I promised all of you before Halloween. I've also been moving forward, working on an Undertale theory with my friend the Sonic God, which should reveal another epic story that's been well hidden, and shed light on why searching for Wingding Gaster might be so darn difficult. Perhaps he's not the one we should be looking for. Then the final theory series will continue, with a look at the overlooked brilliance of the ending to Matrix Revolutions, and how it actually does make perfect sense, and restores Neo to his rightful place as the one. I promised the Funday Papa show I'd have Bunny 4 The Revenge ready in time for their Chocolate Easter Bunny Death Video Marathon two years ago. And the worst part is I actually finished many clips, but got lazy and sidetracked after hitting a hang-up with the special effects. So I'm going to finish that this year too, maybe for Easter, but more likely for Halloween. To see me evolve from a right novice cell phone filmmaker to someone who actually knows a few After Effects tricks, watch the first three episodes in the Bunny Bowling Bomb Trilogy. Then there are my off-the-wall mashup projects I've wanted to do forever, like Goonies vs. X-Men, where Mikey and friends follow a suspiciously conspicuous treasure map to the basement for Xavier's school for gifted youngsters, then try to save their homes by stealing the X jet for cash. If they have anything they can pick up our jet, they deserve to catch us. Hello, there's someone here. Where? I don't know. Keep your eye open. Logan. And there's Five Nights at Steam Powered Giraffes, which pretty much sums itself up in the title. What? There, what? There. Are you doing a show without me? No, uh... So here's looking forward to FNAF World and 2016. Thanks for watching. The next time you hear from me, FNAF will be solved for real. And it's no dream.
take me apart.